As we continue this series on the wisdom of progressive Christianity, we come today uh, looking at one of the crucial questions that many of us bring to faith. And it is this issue of relationships and how they are often not as good, not as life-giving, not as well as we would like them to be. And as Rusty's wonderful prayer really presents us to, so often in our humanness, we have a tendency to think that, well, it's the other guy's responsibility to make it better, right? Yeah, a lot of us like to say, not it. But for our purposes today, we're going to look at relationships not at that intimate personal level, but we're going to go to the 10,000 foot view. Marcus Borg in the book Living the Questions, which is what the sermon series is based on, offers the idea that within scripture there are three meta-narratives that get repeated and lived into and um, talked about and deepened over time and space that deal with the restoration of relationships. They really want you to focus on that restoration piece. Um, In our day and age, oftentimes, we will hear people talk about being spiritual, but not religious. You heard that? And sometimes that's said almost with a a, a degree of pride, like it is better to be spiritual and there's something regrettable about being religious. Which is a little puzzling if you know that religion is based on the Latin base root of re-ligio. L-I-G-I-O. And ligio is the same word that is the root for the word ligament. Does anybody know what a ligament does? It connects bones to muscles, right? It is a connecting device in the body. And so re Ligio is to reconnect. Religion at its very heart, its very purpose, is to reconnect human beings to God and human beings to each other. So essentially, my friends, we are talking about the why of religion today. What is the ultimate purpose of being not just a spiritual person, but a religious person. So this first meta-narrative that Marcus Borg talks about was referenced in our scripture from Exodus. And it looks at the problem that the people of Israel were enduring at that time, which was they were slaves in Egypt. They were in bondage, right? And what is the obvious, evident solution to bondage? If you're in bondage, you want freedom. Absolutely. They needed liberation. And God was with them to help supply that need. Now, one of the things that that specific passage from Exodus talks about was the obligation of families, of parents, to teach their children why this story matters. Why did God bringing us out of Israel, why is that something that we still pay attention to today? And one of the things that the Passover liturgy explicitly says is that this thing that happened all those years ago in Egypt didn't just talk, just, didn't just help our ancestors, our forefathers and our foremothers in faith. It happened to us. In other words, there's this great temptation in Scripture to to think that, oh, well, that happened to those people far long ago and far away. 
And the invitation of scripture is to hear it as an invitation to imagine, to allow ourselves to be touched in our hearts, to be challenged in our minds, and so therefore to put ourselves into that story so that we can imagine what it must have been like for those first Israelites in Egypt and what it is like for others today who find themselves in bondage. Because truly, being in bondage is a human experience that continues to this day. There are the ways of bondage with addiction and mental illness. Poverty is an enormous place of bondage from which it is very difficult for people to free themselves. Racism is a place of bondage for many in our culture. And one of the, one of the ways that racism and poverty connect is through the system of mass incarceration in our country particularly for black and brown men. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to go on a learning visit in the state of Louisiana, and it was called a Pipeline to Prison Learning Tour that was sponsored by the Mennonite Church. And we started in New Orleans because they wanted us to get a sense of what started young children of color on this pathway. And what started it was the truancy laws of New Orleans, one of which was a child could be brought before the truancy officer simply for being out of uniform. Go, they were in school, but not in the required uniform. Which, uh, you know, if you're a, a, you know, a rules is rules kind of person, well, yeah, you, you know it's the rule, show up in uniform which is all very matter of fact until you know that for many of the families in that particular school, the school uniforms were too expensive for them to purchase more than one for each child. And so being out of uniform meant that, well, they didn't have a clean one to wear. And because they were families living in poverty in places where their housing didn't have a laundry facility, and so it took an enormous amount of time, energy, and money, none of which the family had, to get the uniform laundered, all of a sudden, penalizing children for being out of uniform started to seem like a penalty for being poor. And the next place they took us was a juvenile detention facility, a brand new, spanking new, lovely facility that was one of the first things built in the recovery from Katrina. And there in one of the only, in fact, the only place in the building, in the facility that did not have cameras, in a dark hallway, uh, one of the guards shared with us that the city of New Orleans profited $70,000 per child per year. So there's no motivation to not incarcerate those children. And then later in the week, we were taken to visit uh, the maximum security facility in the state of Louisiana where all uh, prisoners who have a life sentence for which there is no parole in the state of Louisiana are um, incarcerated at a prison called Angola. And I had been shocked when we had been in New Orleans to hear family members talk of their family who were at Angola. They referred to them as slaves. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a terrible exaggeration. Why would you say that? Slavery is illegal in this country. Except it's not. In almost every state, you are not required to pay prison laborers. It's starting to sound like slavery, folks. And what we learned at Angola is that um, every prisoner worked. Most of them worked in the fields, in the hot, Louisiana summer, um, were paid around seven cents an hour, out of which they needed to buy their toiletries and things they were required to use. And um, one of the trustees that we met was a young guy who was 14 
And he was in Angola because he and some friends who had had all of those truancy marks against them were horsing around in a 7-Eleven one day. And the owner called and said that they were afraid these kids were about to cause trouble. And about to cause trouble landed this kid with a lifetime sentence with no chance of parole. Felt a lot like slavery. And that message was really hammered home when we learned that Angola was actually on the land of two former slave plantations. And as much as my heart breaks for that particular prison system in Louisiana, I have no idea what the system here in Montana is. Um, one of the things that I know about the cost of bondage is that one of the things that needs to be restored is the relationship of the individual to themselves. Because to have been incarcerated in that way means that human potential, that gifts and graces that God has endowed into a human being are not allowed to develop, are not allowed to express themselves, do not have the opportunity to become the contribution to the world that God created them to be. And so part of the restoration that is so deeply needed from God's grace is within the individual. But there is also, my friends, an enormous cost in our culture when we have folks who are the bondees and folks who are the bond holders. If you know much about our history of slavery, the culture that we even have today of systematic racism is born out of that slave culture in which the souls, the humanity of the people who were the masters were just as damaged, just as warped, just as harmed as the souls of those who were kept captive. And so some of the restoration that is needed is for the individuals all to be healed of that brokenness and for the system that made that bondage possible to be healed as well. And so, you know, that means that, well, part of the system that we find ourselves in this country that needs healing is, well, capitalism. Good Lord, I have no idea how to deal with that. But that is a place where we are looking, truly, that if that's not addressed, that kind of problem perpetuates. So the problem of bondage and liberation is followed in scripture where Borg identifies the problem of exile. And the opposite of exile is return. And the, the history of the Hebrew people in being sent into exile in Babylon, just want to remind you, it wasn't everyone, it wasn't the whole population that was evicted from the land of Judea, it was the elites. It was the priests, it was the rabbis, it was the royalty, and, and actually I said rabbis, but no, it was the priests, because the problem was, as expressed in the psalm, that the people of Judea at that time believed that God lived in the temple in Jerusalem. And so that expression in the psalm, how can we worship the Lord in a foreign land, was a literal question. The only place they knew how to worship God was at the temple. And so it really was a form of torture to have their captors say, sing us your worship music, folks. And they're like, uh, we don't know how. And so one of the problems of exile, when we are told whether it was the Judeans being sent into Babylon, Adam and Eve being sent out of the Garden of Eden, or folks who have a sincere desire to make their home here. One of the problems when we're told you can't be here, 
is a problem of identity. Well, who am I if I'm not a resident of the Garden of Eden? Who am I if I'm not a Judean? Who am I if I'm not an American, if I'm not a Methodist, if I'm not a Montanan? I don't know who I am anymore. And so part of the restoration that is called for is one of identity. And, and the thing about return, has anybody ever moved away from someplace and then moved back again later? Did that place stay the same while you were gone? No. Things keep moving, they keep changing, they keep developing. About a decade ago, I visited the town that I went to high school in, and there had been 10 miles of cornfields in between my high school and where my family lived. There's now 10 miles of houses. Life has not stood still there. And so part of returning, of coming home again, is the necessary shift to expand our sense of what counts as home. What is our home place? And who are our home people? Who are we going to allow to be our neighbors? Historically, we don't have a good track record with this question. I've come to you from serving an area of Colorado where in, in the district I was responsible for, there were three massacre sites where U.S. troops had slaughtered peaceful Native Americans. There is much that we have to repent of. Our immigration policies over and over again in our history have had periods of time where the numbers of people who could come into this country who were white were very different, far more generous than the numbers allotted to people who were brown. And sometimes different ethnicities got put in the brown category. Sometimes the brown people were from Spain. Sometimes they were Jewish. Sometimes they were Irish. So you could be brown without even being brown. We've got a weird history with that. And I think perhaps one of the problems we're experiencing right now with our policies that have detention facilities on our southern border, one of, one of the things that makes that really difficult for us is that it is a real and present modern day example that touches on parts of our history that we might have gotten to like gloss over previously. But now it's in our face every day. And so there is this historic, communal, collective, cultural wound that is being opened up and the depth of it is being exposed to our view with every news report. And so the, the wounds that we carry within us over those things in our history that we're not proud of that occur as, well, sin, are now having an opportunity to kind of spark those nerves at us and tell us, wake up, pay attention. This is wrong, and it's been wrong for a long time. What are you going to do about it? Which takes us to the third arc that Marcus Borg talks about, which is the restoration of relationships as expressed by Jesus in the New Testament. And, and we're reminded that in the New Testament, there was a very strong, significant system in place for the restoration of relationships. It was the temple worship where you went to sacrifice an animal in order to atone for your sins. And trust me, there were lots of sins to potentially atone for because there were 613 laws in the Hebrew scriptures, and if you broke any of them, you needed to go sacrifice at the temple. That's a lot of consciousness to bring to, oh, I'm bad, I made a mistake, I need to apologize. And into that system came Jesus. And 
I invite you this afternoon to look up in your Bible, the Gospel of Luke, and turn to chapter 7. And at the end of chapter 7, there's an encounter where Jesus has gone to eat dinner with one of the Pharisees. And I want to bracket that and have you pause and mentally consider that for a moment. Jesus had gone to eat dinner with one of the people who constantly argued with him and told him he was wrong. When's the last time you went to go have dinner with someone who always disagrees with you and tells you you are wrong? Most of us don't have the courage or the discipline to put ourselves in dialogue with people we don't agree with. And yet that's where Jesus was. And in that space, a woman from the community who's just described in the story as a sinful woman, we don't know why or how she was so sinful, she interrupts them and she proceeds to wash Jesus' feet with her tears, dry them with her hair, and then anoint his feet with ointment. And the Pharisee is appalled and says, why are you allowing her to do this? And Jesus, being Jesus, of course, told a parable in answer to that question and asked the Pharisee, if someone with a small debt has their debts forgiven and someone with a large debt has their debts forgiven, which of them is going to be more grateful? And the Pharisee replied, well, the one with the bigger debt. And Jesus said, likewise, this woman who had many sins is forgiven much. And so here we have this story of Jesus Forgiving sins as part of his ministry. He was mediating sin. He was offering the gift of grace and God's love and forgiveness right there as part of his daily ministry. And I lift that story up to you because many of us have been exposed to the idea that Christ died for our sins. You heard that one before? And yet here's this story where Christ is saving someone from their sins and is very much alive. And so I invite us to just sit with that juxtaposition. We're going to have a whole sermon series later um, in the months to come that talks about who is Jesus for us and how does salvation work and what's the purpose of the cross and is this dying for our sins business all there is? I'll offer to you the information that that concept, that theological idea, did not come about until St. Anselm composed it in the 12th century. So the first 1,200 years of Christianity, no one believed that Jesus died for their sins. So I'm just going to invite you to let that marinate in the back of your mind. And we'll talk more about that in the months to come. But for now, I want us to, to really kind of grasp that... This, this need for restoration in the face of our own self-perception of sinfulness, of I've done something wrong, I haven't done something right, I haven't done enough, whatever brings us to a space, a heart space of feeling disconnected, of feeling separated from God's divine love, that Jesus is indeed our access point, to turn to him, to ask for his love, his companionship, his help, and he provides it gladly and freely. And does that not just for us as individuals, but also communally, for congregations, for communities, for nations. Because going back to our second meta-narrative, that one of exile, that message of you're not allowed to be here, the ultimate expression of that idea being played out in our world today 
is mass shootings. It is an extreme, violent form of exile. You can't be here anymore. And what I can name for you is that this is a sin. And of the two mass shootings that took place yesterday, and my God, my God, how horrific is it that there was more than one in a single day. But at least one of them was racially motivated. Going back to that sin of systemic, institutionalized racism, when a shooter travels how many hundred miles from Dallas to El Paso simply for the purpose of telling brown people, no, you can't be here, literally. All is not well in our nation. All is not well in our culture. All is not well in our communities. All is not well in our congregation. All is not well inside of us as individuals because the toxicity of oppressors and oppressed, of those who say you can't be here and those who are run out of town, of us who find ourselves falling short, of somehow being agents of grace in ways that make a difference, all of that is connected. And going to God as our safe home base, as we explored with the children, that is called for in all kinds of ways. Because my friends, we are called. We are called to be agents of grace. We are called to be people who put our prayers into action. We are called to be deliverers of God's love, not only in the words of our mouths, but the actions of our hands and feet. We are called to be the ones whom our God works through in order to heal and release those in bondage, to give them freedom, to bring exilees home, and to restore us to the bosom of God's love and to each other as brothers and sisters. And so the challenge before us today, my friends, is how? How will we allow our baptismal promises to shape our steps? How will we allow ourselves to be called into the future that God desires for us? A future of hope where we indeed stand not only for life being good and life-giving for us, but good and life-giving for all who seek it. And so, beloved, how will you receive God's call? And how will you act upon it? Amen? Amen.